Hi, my name is Iris. I'm from Snapshot and VP of Product and Partnerships. And I'm today's guest on Tech Talk Travel. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tech Talk Travel. Today I've got a, a wonderful guest with me, uh, Miss Iris Steinmetz from Snapshot. Iris, thank you for being on the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great. I want to kind of touch on a few things with you today. Let's we'll start with your background because I'd like to dig in to understand how you came from operations and working into in the tech side and then into the current position you're in. And then I also want to talk a little bit about um, not necessarily what Snapshot is doing as a whole, but I really want to try to get your opinion on this whole open API piece and the marketplaces that are coming up in the industry and the impact that they're having on, on the industry as a whole that, that we're generally facing. So with all of that said, let's get started on your, on your okay. background. What was it that inspired you uh, to go from operations into the tech side and then to stay uh, for 16 years in, in a company as big as Micros at the time and perhaps admittedly it wasn't as big maybe when you joined them it grew obviously over the time um, and then what the transition was like for you moving into uh, a company like Snapshot mm -hmm. because there must have been a, a, big a big difference there for you and I'd like to hear your perspective on that. I started like the classical way, hotel school, and then um, worked in a very short time frame, like kind of six years in every department you can think of, and very quickly made it through the ranks, right? So like not only have I been in every department, I've had as well every position in the department. Um, and, and that has been like of great help um, to understand the hotel overall. And um, in 1998, I then, with 26, um, started, uh, like, run my first hotel as a GM for two years. After two years, and being 28, I had seen every part of a hotel, like, what was there to do next? So, I decided, like, probably larger hotels, like, being in charge of a hotel, like, of a hotel, of a hotel chain. Mm. Um, and I applied, like, for... Um, various management programs to move in there, which was a great time because um, there was hardly any female man uh, general managers and all the managers which were there were getting a certain age, so many larger chains were actually looking, Malia, like, like many, were looking uh, to, to get fresher replacement, younger, um, more diversified. And, um, and then I saw an app from Fidelio, which happened to be like an hour from my parents. <laughs> so, um, I like there was a German and an English one. I applied to the English one because I had never applied anywhere in German. And that brought me uh, up to uh, Marcus Fidelio in Neuss, mm -hmm. the regional office. Had mm -hmm. I applied in German, I would have been to the local office, which happened to be in the same building. Mm -hmm. And I just sent my CV. There was not even a job as such. And when, I, when they asked me for an interview, they offered me several um, options. Mm -hmm. One of them was yield installer, and one of them was technical pro product manager for their CRS product and their CRM product. I looked at them and I said, I probably better be installer because I have no clue of technical. I mean, literally, I knew how to write a letter in Word and, and, and work the version 6 and version 7 yeah. front of the system. Yeah. I had no idea otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they said, no, we think you're actually better suited for technical uh, product manager for the CRS product. So I said, well, do you think you can do that? And I said, look, if you can manage something, it takes you, like, if you can manage, like it might take you some time to get into it, but if you can manage, you can manage. So yeah, it will take me some time to get used to it, but if I have a good crew, then I should be able to learn. Mm, then I had uh, a second um, interview with um, Peter Stenz, um, who um, was at the time a vice president for IMI. Mm -hmm. um, and literally in the interview he asked me, like, so, what do you know about computers? I was like, well, I can write a letter in Word and, you know, I, I can use your front office system really well. And he was like, um, all right, let me rephrase that. Would you say you get on with computers? I was like, 
all right? Like, if you mean that, if you show me which corner to hit once, whether I'll find it the next time, absolutely, I got the job. You know, that's how I ended up. And I didn't really think at the beginning I would last. And then I thought, like, after the first few weeks, I'll do this for two years, right? After two years, I have a clear idea, and then I do something else. Yeah, 16 years later. <laughs> this is how it can sometimes go. Yeah, yeah, it is. What was your motivation to leave that type of, I guess you could say, security within a company to have uh, an established position, a long time um, service a now? Reputation. Reputation. What was your motivation to go from large to smaller, certainly smaller, and how was that transition for you personally? Mm. When I started in Micros, um, Eni, Europe, Africa, Middle East, was half of one floor. And Opera was called NPI. Like on the door it said NPI, New Product Introduction. Right? So we were very startupish. Like um, CRSs were mostly um, proprietary to hotel chains. Yeah. Interfaces didn't exist. Yeah. Like when I, like when we went for presentations, in order to convince like those large uh, customers, um, usually the best help if you arrive with three laptops. Like one would be the CRS, one would be the PMS, and then you have the interface in the middle, yeah. and you had a little traffic light, yeah. and you would like send like a, in, in, in a, a reservation in CRS. And then you'd say, like, look at the traffic light, how it changes. And then like, ta-da, it's in PMS. Yeah. That would sell at the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, like, it, we were very much like, um, like a startup. It was an oracle what made me um, uh, leave. It was more that, um, A, suddenly I got some very good offers. And that made me wake up going like, oh, hang on. It's maybe a good moment to think about something else. Um, and then it was, a, as well for my private life, it was a good moment to do this. Um, and I couldn't see at that point in time, and maybe that would have still taken longer, where my place would have been in Oracle. Like, I did get an, uh, um, an, an offer which Oracle thought was very attractive, and on the paper it was very attractive. But for me as a person, I don't think it would have helped me evolve. It would have been back to the roots, I would have been again with the CRS, which I love CRS, I love distribution, I think it's great, but like running CRS again wouldn't have helped me yeah. e evolve from yeah. where I was. Yeah, I and really all I wanted to do was integrations and partnerships. And there came this company and, yeah. and they taught me exactly that at the time. It was with Stephen Burke and Michael Heinze and Michael Heinze was telling me all these wonderful technical things. Look, you don't have to wait for a release to get stuff. Like, you know, we have all these possibilities. and. You can build your team and you can do all of these things and not just PMS or just, you can do everything. That sounded really good. And there's no looking back now as no. VP, VP of product and partnerships. I'd like to just try to understand from your perspective, A, what's a true open API and how does that affect everyone else that's in the marketplace today from the tech side? I think really like um, open API um, is like, blockchain or a couple of other <laughs> terms very much used in marketing sense and and often not reflecting the same if you really look in detail. Mm. So for some an open API might be that their specifications are out there and not even like like an SDK or something, like not, not even that you could develop actually but just the description of it. And for others it really means that um, you can just try it out uh, online, connect, maybe get like a certification, maybe not, that really depends like what it is, um, and, and, and then off you go. And here I think, again, the hospitality industry uh, is doing things a bit slower than other industries. Mm. I mean, and, and um, I was um, uh, sitting at a panel in, um, in High Tech Amsterdam this year, and I was exactly this point about all right, what are other industries doing? And, and if you look at someone like Facebook or, or whoever, where like, okay, yeah, you just uh, get on with it, do your job and, uh, and up you go, which has now changed as well due to like the problems they had. But <laughs> yes. not exactly like that. It was actually quite difficult these days to do yeah. this. We had to redo the whole thing. So right. yeah, we've been through that. Um, but um, 
that there is still like large differences on what one or the other understand. And um, also, many understand, and, and here again, of course, there's my own personal view of open APIs coming in a lot, but uh, many understand as well that everything is allowed, which I don't think is the right, like open a APIs doesn't mean no rules mm -hmm. in my eyes. So um, basically, I, I do think that open APIs without details needs to be something which you can easily get access to with low or no barriers, um, which allows you to do business, which is mutually beneficial in a very fast turnaround time. Right. That would be really like for me ideal. Yeah. Now, again, like does that mean no rules? No, like depending on the nature of the data, you will have some certification or a sort of a checkpoint. Um, there's a whole different ball game if you're just pulling out some data to present it, like let's say on a dashboard or in some visual form, or if you're actually um, sending credit card data to complete a transaction or something. I think, like you know, it's like taking the extremes, but um, just to illustrate a bit. Mm. Um, and and so for snapshot, um, our um, PMS APIs like are like so inbound, so to speak, um, are out there, everyone can look at, there's no um, secret there. We actually used it for um, HTG, like I'm leading a work group there for um, business analytics to make it as well like more broader um, use, like this certain way of, of, of getting the data for, for business uh, analytics. But so the API is out there. Um, you cannot create a sandbox yourself, but that is more from like the way how it works for us uh, rather than that we don't want them to, to do it. But one email and uh, or one contact and we'll set up a sandbox for you, you can play with it. Um, and for the outbound, so what our, we have um, different levels of like what we do with our outbound APIs. So there's the marketplace you earlier mentioned, then we have data consumers. Um, who want access uh, to the data we have um, from the PMS and um, we have hotels which are only uh, actually having their own developers and want to get access to their own data and work with that. So for any of those, sign up to the developer portal and then you have everything available there including a sandbox you can, you can play mm. with mm. Um, and uh, then let us know when you're ready or at any time we're happy to help mm. because this is something which is quite interesting. Your APIs can be as open as they want to be if you have people not from the industry trying to work with it, sometimes it's hard for them to understand. Yeah. And certainly we're like not doing a great job of documenting everything and I think that's with most of us we all know that we could do better and sometimes um, it's the time factor, the resource factor, sometimes we just don't know how to explain it for outside people, right? Mm -hmm. It depends. But um, yeah, and I think like talking about like the guys of like Muse or, or Appaleo, they're doing a great job of mm -hmm. like actually making their, their APIs available like that. But here it goes. Everyone has open APIs. So everyone goes, I have open APIs right against the, my, my APIs. Which means that depending what company you are, you want to do business with three different companies, you're still writing three interfaces. Yeah. Because it's still three different sets of open APIs. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where people like Happy Cloud or Impala or Snapshot even come in, like where they can actually help like the companies mm. um, or as well the, the hotelier looking for a solution to, to, to streamline this. Mm -hmm. uh, this so almost act as like that bridge between the, all three of them. So you write, write to one and you get to three. But again, yeah. there's a big difference between all of us. Yeah. Um, again, and, and we can include here as well SiteMiner if you like, or yeah. the marketplaces of that sort. Because where um, Impala is um, um, moving the data between PMS and, and a third party, like without a platform in between, and Happy is building, um, um, the, it's doing basically the same, they're stored for like I think seven days, mm. like so in case something goes wrong, mm. and they're mainly building to um, um, data um, requests from the outside and then depending what is needed as well to the PMS. 
snapshot is different in as such that due to the analytics tool we have and the underlying platform we've built up over time, we have as well the platform in the middle. And, and that is quite um, a differentiator. And, and I think here it really depends on what you are looking for, will you go with one or with the other? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, good. If we were to look at it from the way it was back in the day when you started with Fidelio, or Microsoft Fidelio, and to today, I think it's fair to say that without a doubt, we have made enormous um, developments and transitions forward. And I think what with the, the environment that we're in today, with the whole, let's say, API environment and, and cloud-based solutions, it does cut a lot of that effort out. And I think that's a good thing. But I think, as you mentioned before, it's being able to write to one that will then connect to many. I think that's perhaps the next phase that uh, is, is needed in many ways. And that's something I would love to see. Yeah. Um, and um, many, like, there are, like, um, bodies like HTG, for example, yeah. like, trying to do that and have tried to do that for a long time. Mm. Um, but that doesn't quite fit the philosophy of many of the younger companies. Right. So, like, for them, this will not be the, the body they would go to, if at all. Yeah. You yeah. know, if someone can bring them on, all to one table, but yeah. uh, maybe it will be someone like yeah. the Impalas or the, the Happies, like, who, yeah. Will, yeah. Uh, who will build that. It'll be interesting to see, won't it? I think in the mm. next few years, how that's going to transition. I mean, on. honestly, if like you can um, just take like a couple of days because you know the specs already, you know what you want to get out of. If you talk to, to Apaleo, I'm sure they will say, like, but our specs are so easy, like, you can yeah. easily do that. I mean, all of us uh, would say that, yeah. right? Yeah. However, the fact is, it always depends, like, how knowledgeable the person on the other side is, and you still have to do it. And then That's it depends right. what it means on your end. Do you have to just build another adapter? Is it easy for you to copy it over? Um, like, um, are you even able, like, I mean, how many companies are still out there? They can't do JSON, mm. they can't do RESPL. Like, they're still, like, XML is the only thing, or, you yeah. know, yeah. CSV. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, from that aspect, <laughs> hey, you wouldn't see, like, <laughs> like, like, I have 45 PMS connections, and if you would see, like, some of them, yeah, like, what, really? what, yeah. I was lucky enough that because of our APIs um, being well documented and out there, like 97% um, have written against our specifications, which is fantastic because I get to harmonize the data. Like already, I have like a certain guarantee of what comes up. But yeah, like for them to to add, to make sure that they have the the data in the right format, or like I mean, in China, you get like questions, or I had questions like. Do you want the the system the government sees, or do you want access to the system the hotel really uses? Yeah. You know, like yeah. so, yeah. open APIs for them would not necessarily work. No, but China is a different beast than okay. the right. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Now you also mentioned a little bit back about um, hotels having their own developers mm -hmm. now. I'm starting to hear that more and more. It seems to be becoming a bit of a trend, uh, especially perhaps with larger groups that have, have budgets to spend on that. Are you seeing that rather than hiring IT managers that they're actually replacing IT managers with developers? No. Because they're not necessarily needed to have IT guys on site anymore because the infrastructure really isn't there anymore? Or are you seeing that they're still hiring IT guys but are those IT people really just support people? The IT guys are operational guys for the infrastructure for whatnot. What I'm saying is like what we're seeing more and more is that um, and it's interestingly not necessarily only the large guys. The okay. large guys have been doing it for years. They always have, through like their money, through their power, through their standing, uh, had always the opportunity. But now smaller chains like 100 uh, hotels, yeah. 50 hotels, and even smaller, I have some with 20 hotels, like several actually, like they see an opportunity of, of, of building um, software to suit their needs yes. and to not just like pick off the shelf and companies like I reckon you like are mm -hmm. like exactly working on that and helping them mm -hmm. like they work with Citizen M a lot mm -hmm. I mean there's so many talented developers out yeah, there absolutely. just tell them what app you want yeah. tell them how you want it yeah. and you get it to for your hotel the general hoteliers or even students listening now the, the, the practicality of, of the open API environment 
enables that opportunity. So without, without having the APIs available, then let's just say 10 years ago, that would have been a very difficult thing to do. Absolutely. For someone to come in and, and just pick, pick something off a website or get documentation off a website and then start writing code to it, that's, that was unheard of. No, it, would, it wouldn't have happened. Like, so in that sense, we've made tremendous progress. Absolutely, and that comes with lots of factors. I mean, it's of course. I mean, simple things like the internet stability, yes. yeah, that helped, that yeah. helped cloud systems. Mm -hmm. But as well, a lot of these new PMS cloud partners came out, and more systems being cloud-based has largely helped. Mm -hmm. But as well, the spirit like which came with that, like, like being more adventurous, trying out things, trying to go off the proven track. Mm -hmm. And that really gets our industry quite exciting right now, because yeah. what is there in another five years, yes. right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's, it's really mm -hmm. cool stuff. Yeah. And, and that, this comes with sorry. like hotels actually saying it's not good enough anymore like what you're offering me there like um, uh, uh, you established company or even new cloud system I don't want just like pink, red or green yeah. Yeah? yeah I want it like in stripes and I will get exactly. what I want because yeah. my staff needs it to do their job right yeah. yeah I don't think today hotels really I, look, I could be wrong maybe they do whether or not they really fully appreciate the value of the data that they hold on, on the guest and how they can use that data, um, not just while they're there, but before and after and in between. Do you, think, do you think hotels, when you speak to them, that they're starting to understand that they actually hold the, the control in that sense? They, they, they have that data, that is their, that's their um, golden egg, if you like. It's powerful information, and um, I think uh, what, what I'm trying to say is I think from a hotelier's perspective, they can leverage that more than perhaps they are. And I know the chains leverage it exceptionally well, but they've got the, the infrastructure behind them and often the financial team to do it. But for the smaller groups, they're starting to, and even for the independents, how, like a company like Snapshot, that is a data aggregator, if you like, how can they work with companies like yourself to really maximize the data that they have on site. Let's just say they're a, five, a 50 room boutique property here in Berlin. They've got a whole stack of data on their guests. How can they best leverage that data with the tools available to them to increase profits, ex have a better experience for guests prior to arrival, during their stay and even after? I think you touched on an interesting point there because I don't think it's so much the tools. The tools are there. Yep. In the past, um, it was often only seen in, in, in limited areas, profiles. Like profiles has been already, when I was still in CRS business, seen as very valuable by, by uh, many hotel chains. Um, individual hotels, not so much. Because like maybe like... Um, uh, a, a returning guest like they would notice but they wouldn't have a loyalty program or they wouldn't like necessarily drive that um, but that there's other data and we're talking not only structured but as well unstructured data yeah. how, how, uh, how, how important that can be I mean take for example guest requests there is no standard for guest requests. Mm -hmm. We're actually now like going to build guest request messages mm -hmm. because just imagine what you can get out of this if you capture the guest requests and 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 do some analysis on that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, or I mean, take things like the ability if like if you know that a hotel room um, has until lunchtime not being opened by the master key. Well, hey, you might have a problem later yeah. there, or it has been opened X amount of time. I mean, there's so many areas yeah. where data, yeah. if collected and combined rightly, is very, very powerful. Exactly. And exactly. that people are not yet aware of. Yeah. What would be some, well, let's say, what would be the top three tips of advice that you would give a, a person working in the industry, so a, a hotelier now operationally, considering going into the technology side of it, knowing what you know and, and what, what you've gone through in your career, what would be... Work-wise, yeah. you're saying? Yeah. I think the most important part is that, first of all, you should look at what you like about of the hospitality uh, part, the hotel, whatever you work in most, so to see your passion. Because there's 
most likely a technical component to it. So if you can move into the tech space with a, as, a, as a domain expert, so to speak, of your area, then it's obviously easier and um, always when you know something it's more fun. And I think you just be, need to be open-minded and like, uh, uh, you know, have a good look around and then maybe see where, where it takes you. Mm. Like, I mean, look at me, you don't necessarily get uh, stuck on, on, on one thing. Mm. So mm. from that. Do you think it's important nowadays to have a, a general understanding of technology or do you think someone with very little knowledge of technology um, can still make that transition? Well, to start with, I think they have a lot more technical knowledge than what we used to have. Like there is a whole different acceptance yeah. of technology as part of their daily life, yeah. of, of finding the way around it uh, than, than what we had. Or, um, so. so Yes, it definitely helps if you have some understanding, but is it a must? No, I mean, if you want to become a developer, probably yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you um, uh, want to find your way around first, find out whether it's even something for you and then potentially, um, you know, do something to, once you found your, your direction, uh, do courses or, or have training to uh, improve that then I definitely mm. think you can still find uh, your way into the tech space yeah, without yeah. having substantial uh, uh, technology yeah. Uh, yeah. knowledge. Good. And I'm always a strong fan of having people from the industry come into the tech space because they understand mm -hmm. what's needed and they can often add value in so many different areas. Iris, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great having you on the show. Really good. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoyed that, make sure you hit the subscribe button and don't forget to hit the bell next to the subscribe so that you get your notifications by email. And uh, we've got a very uh, interesting guest coming up uh, on our next show as well. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And until then, it's bye for now. Thanks. 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 Thank you so much. Awesome.